Holy cow, the Fed just cut federal funds rate by 50 basis points, Josh. What does that actually mean? They think it is appropriate to cut more and still not be stimulated. Any further decline in mortgage rates will be minimal. The Fed does not directly control mortgage rates. So to me, I think that's aggressive. I don't think it's needed unless we see further deterioration in the employment market. The last five years has taught us anything. It should be that the future is far more volatile and unpredictable than you think. This is The Educated Home Buyer with Jeb Smith and Josh Lewis. Holy cow, the Fed just cut federal funds rate by 50 basis points, Josh. What does that actually mean? We've got a lot of people reaching out thinking the interest rates are going to decline by 50 basis points. I'm not going to do anything now. I'm not going to refi. I'm not going to purchase a home because rates are going to decline further. Let's take a minute here, digest what happened yesterday so we can help create educated home buyers. Uh, education is the important part because, Jeb, we get the craziest stuff. Um, have a borrower right now that hasn't wanted to sign their disclosures for 10 days. They're going to save $400 a month, eliminate a credit card that has 200 something dollars of interest on a $500 monthly payment. But because the Fed was going to cut, and it's every day, I've, I've given them all of the academic research that shows what happens with Fed cuts. So we're going to do the, to this today. We're going to lay this out for you guys so that you know what it does and doesn't mean. Is it a positive? Is it a good sign? Um, it, it is in terms of interest rates and affordability. Um, it's not a panacea. It doesn't change things. It's not a time machine back to 2021. But uh, we're going to go through it, break it down for you, and let you know what we know today and what we can expect and believe is going to happen going forward into the next year. Yeah, we filmed an episode a couple episodes back and talked about something similar here. But I think this conversation is different in the fact that we now know what the Fed did, right? There was this this idea that they were going to cut 25 basis points. But there was also you know, a, a thought that they could come out and do 50. And they came out and did the 50 basis points, which is a little bit more aggressive move. Um, and, and after that, the, you know, federal chair Powell came out and, and talked about trying to get a little bit ahead of, of the curve, if you will, when it comes to interest rate cuts and, and all of that. And I think the problem, Josh, is what people see as headlines. We often talk about context, right? Not just reading the headlines, but understanding what the headline means because the headline often is an attention grabber. It's there to get you to read the article. The problem is most people don't read the article or listen to the story. They, read the headline, and then take it and apply it to their situation, which creates further chaos down the road. And I think it's important right now, because we're at this point where interest rates have declined a good 1% or more since April, um, that you know it, you should really look at your situation carefully to figure out if now is the right time, not waiting on a better opportunity down the road. And I think that's where a lot of people are sitting, and I think it's important to back our way into what's going on so that people understand it. What I would say, Jeb, is if the last five years has taught us anything, it should be that the future is far more volatile and unpredictable than you mm -hmm. think. So if something makes sense today, you probably should lock in that certain known future versus betting, hoping, dreaming that it's going to be significantly better in the future. For the most part, we've talked about some of the worst advice ever in mortgage and real estate is uh, marry the house, date the rate. And we had people that for the better part of two years have payments way beyond what their comfort level is. A lot of the people I'm talking to about refinance right now are panicking because their 2-1 buy down is getting ready to go up to 7.5%. Um, and they want to get out of that before that happens. So it's important to look at what we know and make our decisions based off of certainty. So we are going to talk about some projections today um, because we have to. We, we have to take a look at it, but we're going to contrast those with what a lot of these people are thinking. I had another borrower, Jeb, uh, that bought and, and at a high rate. We do need to get this thing refinanced mm -hmm. for them. And the call yesterday was, oh, how, how much lower are rates now? Because we had looked at rates last Friday. So him, his thinking is 50 basis points lower. Literally no change from last Friday to mm -hmm. yesterday. And from the day before, they were slightly worse. When we say slightly worse, it would be almost imperceptible to you. If we looked at Mortgage News Daily yesterday, they were up 0.04% from the day before. So truly imperceptible to the borrower. But that is how the market reacted. And why is that, Jeb? We talk about 
Wayne Gretzky's famous quote is he would always skate where the puck was going, not where it is. And that is what the markets do, whether it's the futures market, the bond market. They are looking to the Fed um, announcement much more so than what they were actually going to do. So we talked about this many times on the live show, on different episodes of the podcast. Going into this meeting, 25 or 50 basis points was far less important than what they said. So the dot plots, which is their projection out over the next couple of years, and then also why they did this, what to expect next. And uh, it was a very neutral announcement yesterday. It wasn't dovish, meaning, hey, rates are going to go a bunch lower. It wasn't hawkish, like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to step the heck out of the way. It was, we think this is an appropriate step to more get, get to a more neutral interest rate, and then we're going to see how the economy reacts and play out. But in the meantime, what are we talking about? The bond market has already got uh, ahead of this. And as you said, over the last 90 days, rates are almost 1% better on the mortgage side. 1%. So we had a whole year of borrowers, if not a year and a half of borrowers that closed at those rates. Nearly everyone I talked to today can justify an interest rate reduction refinance. The question is, do we wait? Do we think it gets better? And we'll go a, a little bit into that. But Jeb, you want to talk about what the what the Fed actually said yeah. yesterday in that meeting? Because I, I think that's important, right? Is is let's kind of start with the back end, the, the things that uh, you know they talked about, right? Versus what it actually impacted. So let's start with kind of the projections, Josh. What they're thinking, where people think it are going, where people think it's going. We we talked about Fannie Mae coming out with updated projections. We've talked about Lauren Chun, chief economist for the National Association of Realtors what he's talking about. And I think all of those things are important because it brings, you know, educated people all to the same place and all have a little bit different opinion of how it's going to play out per se. But at the end of the day, it, it could help people make educated decisions now. And I think that's the important piece. So let's look at those dot plots. The dot plot is, um, they do it, I think, at three, possibly four meetings a year. They give updated projections of what they think will happen. Now, we've talked about this. You can make fairly reasonable projections out a year. They go two plus years out. So uh, let's look most closely. They did 50 basis points yesterday, and they uh, announced that their expectation is there will be another 50 basis points by the end of the year. So there's two more meetings, two more quarter point cuts if you take them at their word and, and nothing changes, deteriorates, or improves in the economy. Mm -hmm. Then their expectation for 2025 is 100 basis points. So they meet eight times a year. That's every other meeting a quarter basis point. That is a pretty um, calm and measured cutting cycle. And they did uh, phrase it that way. Powell in the press conference said, this is the, the start of a cutting cycle. He didn't say this is a one-off. He didn't say, hey, we wanted to do 50 basis points just so we could be done and step back to the sidelines. They think it is appropriate to cut more and still not be stimulative. They're not trying to stimulate the economy. They're trying to take away some of the restrictive nature of those higher rates. And they will figure out as they go what that endpoint looks like. So the last thing, they go out to 2026. I don't put a whole heck of a lot of stock in this, but they think another 50 basis points. So uh, the terminal rate to them, they think is 2.9%, somewhere under 3%, which tells us another two points of cuts in the Fed. So that's going to be interesting to keep in mind, Jeb, because some of the experts we're going to talk about here are, are reflecting or saying, this is all priced into the market already. Well, well, let's talk about restrictive policy, right? Because I think it's important for the listener, the viewer to understand what they mean when they say restrictive. So there's there's the federal funds rate, which at the moment is sitting at what, 4.75%? Is that where we are? Or is it 5%? Yeah. I, I it's 4.7 to 5, I think, is the Okay, 4.75 to 5. Um, and, and inflation, uh, headline inflation's at 2.6 or so, and core's at... I don't know, two, nine, something like that. Um, so what happens is when, when you have the federal funds rate higher than, than the rate of inflation, you assist, essentially have a restrictive policy. So say, for example, inflation gets down to two, Josh, and the Fed ends up lowering over this cycle down to two, nine, you still have a restrictive policy. You don't have them um, stimulating the economy in any way. So the Fed, in theory, can continue to cut rates for some period of time and it shouldn't, in theory, really impact the growth of, of the economy so much because of where inflation is. But what are your thoughts? I mean, well, this – go ahead. 
let, what I was going to say is let, let's give that contrast. During COVID, when they took rates to zero, inflation was still in the 2% range. Right. So we had negative 2% real rates. It paid you money to borrow Correct. because almost anything you did with that money was going to grow at 2% or higher and you were paying zero for that. Now, is that really zero? Most people didn't have zero borrowing costs. And that's another contrast there. Fed funds was at zero. Were you ever able to borrow at zero in the United States? No, you weren't. But borrowing costs were really, really low and your ability to get a return. So that's that contrast of what you were just talking about, Jeb, of positive real rates and very highly positive real rates, almost you know closing in on 3% real uh, interest rate. And we need to get that down closer to what neutral is, where they're neither stimulating the economy or putting the brakes on. Right. And so with that, let's talk about, uh, you know, futures market, what the futures market's pricing in, because you've, you've talked about what the dot plop, dot plop, plop, the plot, the dot plot, I can't even say that, dot plot says, um, but what what are the traders, what are actually interest rate traders, people betting real money out there in the market predicting, because they're, they're a little bit more aggressive in their stance. Sometimes they can get ahead, maybe a little too, too far ahead, um, which they did for the better part of 2024, right? A lot of us thought, in March, you know, we were talking in January, Josh, December, January of, of last year about how the Fed could start cutting rates in March. And then we talked about May. And now it's September and we saw the first cut. It was an aggressive cut. But now the futures market is pricing in a little bit more aggressive stance, which, again, the reason we're telling you this is not because we're saying, hey, rates are going lower. It's just, hey, these are the predictions. Some of this, if it's true, is going to be built into the market. So you shouldn't necessarily be thinking all of this is going to happen at the drop of a hat when they actually announce it. Absolutely. So we talked about the, the Fed three to four times a year puts out their projections. Well, every day, the futures market puts out their projections and then actual wagers. So we have traders making bets on what's going to happen going forward. And then with the dot plots, we have economist experts somewhat detached from the economy in their ivory tower putting out their projections. Neither one's perfect. Neither one has been 100% right. There was a big change yesterday in those dots from the last time. Mm -hmm. um, so a really big one. So the, the Fed funds futures market is pricing in an 89% chance of 75 basis cuts before points of cuts before the end of the year. And we just talked, there's only two more meetings. Jeb, that means another 50 basis points at one of those two meetings. Um, either the one immediately after the election, which is probably unlikely, or the one in, in early December. So to me, I think that's aggressive. I don't think it's needed unless we see further deterioration in the employment market, um, which we got weekly claims today. It was the lowest since like May. So is it great? No, but it's certainly not worsening in real time. So we would have to see the situation deteriorating to get 75 basis points when the Fed has told us expect 50 and they have two meetings where they could go 25-25. So to me, I think the Fed's futures markets is out over their skis on that one. Then from there, 78% chance of another 125 basis points in 2025. So where I think they're probably wrong, they are probably only going to get 50 this year. But if we only get 50 this year, I think it's pretty reasonable to see uh, 125, 150 next year because we get eight Fed meetings a year. If the Fed is right and they only cut four times next year, 100 basis points total, that's four 25 basis point cuts. That's a very slow and measured pace and process. There is a lot of underlying advanced data that tells us the economy isn't quite as strong as what the Fed thinks. It's clearly not weak. All of the headline data shows um, GDP above 2%, um, unemployment at a historically low level in the low fours. Uh, their projection is to go to 4.86% by the end of next year. And that jives with what Fannie Mae is thinking. So that's not a weak economy. Um, we for for the futures market to be correct we're going to have to get some weak data and that kind of is where what we want to talk about jeb in terms of what is priced in today the the best case scenario for the markets was that 50 basis point cut and we got it so the markets improved a ton so what comes next what comes next is data dependent the fed talks all the time about being data dependent the fed's going to be data dependent and the markets, both in terms of treasuries, which directly impact mortgage rates, and the futures market are going to react to where the puck is going. It, it got, we saw it was moving over here, and now we're here. And now we're going, okay, great. We're all in the same spot. Where is the puck going next? Yeah. Now, so let's, let's kind of, let's talk about something else here. It's not on our outline, but uh, one of our friends of the show, Logan Matashami, um, chief economist for uh, Housing Wire, been on the show. Many of you guys have heard him. Uh, you know, one of the things that he's often said is that the Fed, the last six rate hikes that they did, they they shouldn't have done. 
right? They could have essentially left rates where they were. They were unnecessary um, in their hiking cycle. So is is it fair to say that we can actually get down to, you know, cut six times or, or 150 basis points, however you want to look at it, and get back to where we should have been? And it doesn't really have an impact on the market because it's something that in theory shouldn't have ever taken place based on where the data was at that time. Well, it's not fair to say that it wouldn't have an impact on the market because it did happen. So reversing that unnecessary restrictive stance that not only was overly restrictive, Logan may be pretty dovish saying 150 basis points of cuts or hikes should have never taken place, but they did and they stayed there for a long time. Maybe the number was 50 basis points they should have hiked. Maybe it was 100 basis points and maybe we should have been cutting by the middle of summer. Any way you cut it, it was much more restrictive than it needed to be for much longer. And people expect, just like Fed cuts yesterday, they expect lower mortgage rates today. They expect Fed action and then the economy just jams on the brakes. Mm -hmm. There is a lag to all of this. And we haven't even seen the impact of all of that hiking cycle and maintaining the rates that high for as long as we have. So if, if he's right, we got at least 100 basis points of cuts just to kind of get back to neutral. Mm -hmm. They don't generally do that. They kind of overshoot both ways. We talked about they went too yeah. restrictive. They'll probably go too accommodative. So on that topic, let's look at, at history. So we talked about what the Fed expects. We talked about what the futures market expects. Let's look back at history. Since the 1980s, we have had eight rate cutting cycles by the Fed. They usually last one, two years, some little, uh, you know, a year and a half, some two and a half years but about a, one to two years prior to the first cut from the peak in 10 year yields to the day of the first cut, it averages 140 basis point drop in the 10 year yield. We peaked at 5.02 back in October of 2023, 5.02, 5.03. And right before the meeting yesterday, we were at, uh, what was it? 374. Three, so that's, okay. that's a hundred. Well, it was, Right before the meeting, it was 128 basis points, but we had gotten all the way down to 3.6. So basically right on at what you would expect mm -hmm. prior to that first cut, 140 basis points of improvement. So the market has has done what it is, has, has historically done. They're saying, hey, we're seeing the same information the Fed does, and we are going to adjust yields before the Fed even takes action. So now the market and the Fed are on the same page, which again tells us, Data comes in, what happens next? Over those eight cutting cycles since the 1980s, from the first cut to the, the last cut or the bottom in 10-year yields after that cutting cycle averages another 150 basis points. So with history as a guide, we have seen 50% of the improvement in, in rates. And mortgage rates from the actual peak back to that October 2023, 20, that was where we got to almost 8%. Call it seven and three quarters. Yesterday, we're just a hair over six. So we have one and three quarters improvement. If you, you get a historical correction where we see another 150 basis points and we get a narrowing of, of spreads between 10 year treasuries and mortgage backed securities, which is, is pretty reasonable. You've got rates going into that low to mid four range. You know, is it wise to project that, expect that, think it's going to happen? No, because you pointed out this morning, we're not in normal times. Everything post COVID, there's so much market manipulation in so many different ways. Um, History may not be as good of a guide as it has been historically, no pun intended, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it, it's probably the best guide we have. I think it's better than the Fed's thoughts. I think it's better than the market's thoughts. Well, you know, it's you have me reading this book, Same as Ever, Morgan Hassel, and and one of the things he talks about there, and, and it's something that's known in the markets, is that when, when everybody's expecting something to happen is when the adverse, the opposite could actually be true or could expect that to happen because, you know, there's so much playing on one thing. And so I kind of look at the market now thinking everybody is thinking rates are going to go down, playing a little bit of devil's advocate thinking, okay, because everybody thinks that maybe I'm just, I don't want to be in that camp of, Hey, this is where, because I've honestly, I've been wrong to some degree about rates coming down sooner than I thought they were. They didn't come down as quickly as I thought because of so many things out there. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to think that Rates are going to continue dropping another 100, 150 basis points, not over a two-year period of time because I do think that can happen, but is it going to happen in the next four to six months? And that's where I think a lot of people are confused. It's they're 100%. thinking this is going to happen immediately because – of, of what the Fed said because of what my mortgage guy on TikTok and Instagram and, <laughs> you know, all of these guys are saying because it's now everybody's trying to get business. Let's be honest. Every mortgage person out there, every real estate agent is out there to get business. And so they're out there to promote 
lowering of rates. And this is, you know, what you should do today because, you know, of whatever. And maybe that's the right answer, but maybe it's not. And so that's why we're coming to you with information, you know, for a guided Let, process. If you look will. at that timing, Jeb. Yeah. So from the peak in the 10-year yields in October of 23, also the peak in mortgage rates to where we are today to the yesterday being the, the first Fed cut, that was over a year or, or almost a year, nine, yep. 11 months, okay? We're probably going to see the rest of it. If we're about halfway to the bottom in, in mortgage rates, that could be a two-year process. We may not get all the way there. There are people, and we're going to talk about it here in a second, that don't think we're going any further. But I, abs- I give us a little grace – in terms of being wrong in projections and interest rates, we weren't wrong. We were off on the timing. So don't get me wrong. That is no, still no. wrong. No. It is still wrong. No. Um, but when we zoom out, when we look back 20 years from now, you'd be like, oh, it was just a little bit off in the timing. But when we're living in it and everyone has much higher interest rates than what they want for their mortgage, for purchasing a home, it feels worse than it is. So I do believe we're going to see significantly lower interest rates. But I do believe it's going to be a 12 to 24 month time frame. And there's going to be blips. Rates will go up for periods in that yep. time, just like during the two years when they were going uh, shooting to the moon. We had periods where they dropped for two, three months at a time. So that's not unreasonable to expect that this, we've seen the first big wave. We could give some of it back and then have another little wave and then give some of it back and another little wave. So when you're making your decisions of what this means for you and your family, you can't just sit here and go, hey, these guys gave me, um, the Fed believes this is going to happen. Futures believes it's going to happen. And historically, in the last 44 years, it's happened every time there's a Fed cutting cycle. So I'm going to wait because I know it's going to happen. We're living in strange times where uh, those things have been less, uh, have had less predictive value than previously. Well, and by waiting, if you know, bring up the example of your client to start with, saving $400 a month, paying off a credit card where interest is 22 or 25%, whatever you said. You know, if it takes a year for rates to get down to a point where they're comfortable refinancing, if they're saving, they just lost forty eight hundred dollars over that period of time at four hundred dollars a month. Um, interest on that credit card, depending on what they did with their balance, how they paid it down, whatever, p- potentially went up, um, and so they they could be in a worse position. So it's like, do you do you cash the checks as they come in? Or do you wait for this big check to all happen at one time and take advantage of it then? And and maybe, I mean, I think it will happen, but we don't know. We don't know when that's going to. Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it three years out now? But let's let's take a step back from our opinions. Let's talk about what Lawrence Yoon, chief chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, said yesterday. Because you don't necessarily agree with with the statement here, and I think it it's a good point to uh, to discuss. So he says mortgage rates have already anticipated the Fed's likely path. That is why the thirty year fixed rate has fallen by one hundred and fifty basis points from early in the year to today. Any further decline in mortgage rates will be minimal. Say that again. Any further uh, decline in mortgage rates will be minimal. The Fed does not directly control mortgage rates, and the federal budget deficit is huge. That's something we've talked about a lot, Josh. Future Fed rate cuts are not only anticipated, but will not be as impactful because large federal borrowing will leave less capital available for mortgage lending. So the last part, I don't necessarily agree with the mortgage lending part, the capital deal, but I do think the deficit is a problem. Maybe not today, but it is something that's continuing to build. Uh, But what are your thoughts on that statement when I read it? Well, here, let me read another quote from him that was a few months back. And when I read this, I thought this was batshit crazy. Um, And he's a smart guy, but he regularly says things that I'm like, I I just think he's willfully ignorant. There are certain pieces of academic research that he omits um, to support his opinion. So he's not having unsubstantiated opinions. He's got very good reasons for believing this, but he he leaves out other stuff. But this quote was, the long-term average for mortgage rates is about 7%. That's where we are today. So probably three, four months ago when rates were at 7%, is I think the new normal will be around 6%. The mortgage rate will not go down to three or four or even five. Well, go back to the quote that you had there. It says, the market has already anticipated this. Rates aren't going to go lower. We just went through eight cutting cycles over almost 45 years that from the first cut to the bottom is a a percent and a half. 
So he's saying it's th this time is different. The, the way it's been for the last 50 years, over eight cutting cycles, that's not going to happen because the market is so brilliant that they have already assumed and priced in what the Fed is going to do over the next two years. When I say it that way, you go, that's absurd. That is 100% absurd. The market can get ahead of itself, which we saw last December, but they didn't get 150 basis points ahead of the Fed in terms of where 10-year yields went. The futures market may have got 150 basis points ahead and the futures market, it's important to note that these odds change every day. A week ago, heading into the, the Fed meeting, they were at like 70% odds of a 25 basis point cut. Heading into the meeting yesterday, it was 80% odds of a 50 basis point cut. So in one week, it completely shifted. Those bets are changing on a daily basis. So that piece of it is insane to say that the market's already anticipated and priced in what the Fed's going to do going forward. They may have anticipated and priced in what the Fed's going to do for the remainder of 2024. That's logical and reasonable. But for 2025, for 2026? Absolutely not. And then the second piece of it saying that the federal deficit is so big that it will crowd out other borrowing that only treasuries will sell and mortgage-backed securities, that would indicate that we would have a, a blowout in the spreads instead of the spreads normalizing. So I do think that 10 years will, will continue to improve. Now we're heading into an election and unfortunately we have two candidates. I don't care which one you like. I don't care which one you hate because you probably love one and hate the other. Hopefully you're in the middle and realize neither one of them is ideal, but both of them want to spend money. I think I sent you uh, the thing earlier. Uh, it was a polling group went out and asked Republicans what they thought of Kamala's spending plans and Democrats what they thought of Trump's spending plans. We know in general, Democrats hate Trump and Republicans don't really love Kamala. But when it comes to spending, if either candidate wants to spend money, the other party's like, hey, this is great. So we do have a deficit problem in that Americans love spending. They say when they're polled that they think deficits are a problem, we should get them under control. But when either candidate comes up with a spending plan, bipartisan support, let's spend it. We don't have it, but let's go spend it because that would benefit me. So it is a problem. It's going to be a growing problem. But all of the academic research, we talk about Lacey Hunt a lot, Lacey Hunt going back like 50 years. What happens is you have a slower growth economy as investment in productive purposes gets crowded out by debt service. And that's what we are, are seeing. So um, I think he's wrong on, on both fronts. But again, if he says 5.9 through the end of the year, that's, that's, that's pretty reasonable. 5.9 through the first half of next year. Fannie Mae did their most recent pro projections. They update them every month instead of quarterly like the, the Fed does. And their projection for all of next year is 5.9%. They think that we will start the year at six, which is a little bit lower than where we are right now. Second quarter, five, nine, third quarter, five, eight, fourth quarter, five, seven. So it, that jives pretty well with what you and I have, have thought, or at least I have, that it's going to be a slow grind lower. There is a clear path to lower interest rates, but we're not going to see any more big drops like we've seen over the last 90 days. I want to provide some clarity on what you just said, Josh, because you said rates today are at six, right? So understand if you're a well-qualified buyer out there putting you know 20% down, you're refinancing, you got some equity in your property, you can get lower than a 6% interest rate. In fact, you've quoted people on FHA and VA in the low fives, 5%, 5 buying down points, being in the four. So there are opportunities out there to get better rates than what you see quoted online. So don't just take a blanket rate and apply it to everything. You could be in a better position. You could also be in a worse position. If you have bad credit, you're putting little to no money down, you're probably not the ideal borrower that they're quoting online. Uh, so just understand rates vary. Uh, but if you're in the process to buy a home, you're in the process to refinance and you want to talk to a professional, reach out using that link in the, uh, the description of this video, you can get in touch with Josh, uh, our team here, and we can run through the scenario to see if it actually makes sense and, and, you know, fit your budget. So Josh, let's talk, we talked a lot about projections and all of that, but let's talk about how it impacts the borrowers right now. Like somebody out there in the market that maybe has a loan. Maybe they don't have a loan. Maybe they have credit cards or student loans or, you know, maybe they do have a home, but they have a home equity line. What does it mean when the Fed cuts 50 basis points? Do those people benefit in some way from that cut? So the federal funds rate is the bank overnight lending rate between banks, excess reserve funds they can lend to each other. So it means nothing to you, but it does directly impact the prime rate and prime rate is directly tied to many consumer loans, auto loans credit cards would be the, the two big ones. So if we take the Fed at their word and they say they're going to be 150 basis points lower between now and the end of next year, auto loans, we can almost be assured that they're going to be lower. So if you need a car today, 
and you can put it off six, 12 months, you're probably gonna get a lower interest rate. Um, your credit card, which is egregiously high, is gonna go a little bit lower, but is, is 18 better than 20? Yes, but it's not gonna make a significant difference. Um, home equity lines of credit, personal lines of credit, most often tied to the prime rate, those will come down. Um, you know, for anyone who has a home equity line of credit, I had a borrower reach out yesterday. They've got a two something on their, their first and we have a $200,000 uh, HELOC that they use for doing improvements to their property. And they're like, can we refinance my HELOC? And we don't need to. You got a 50 basis point cut yesterday on your next statement, you got that. And if they do again, cut 50 basis points more in the rest of the year, it's gonna go down again. We don't have to pay to do a new loan. So remember that that's generally your home equity line of credit is the prime rate plus a margin. Mm -hmm. So unless we can get you a better margin today, if your credit score went up, if the home's worth more and the loan to value is lower, so you can get a lower margin. The only reason you want to refinance a HELOC is if you can get a lower margin. So we know prime's going to come down. Everyone with a HELOC is going to benefit from that. The only reason to refinance one of those is, is if you could get a better margin. So you're paying less on top of prime. All right, so now let's talk about the the question that others are asking. You know, we've talked about the refinance or wait. I guess we kind of touched on that a little bit, but let's talk about refinance or wait, buy now or wait. Right, we got a little bit of uh, affordability. You know, has improved because of of this coming down. Prices have stabilized in a lot of markets out there. In fact, some prices have come down in some markets out there because of an increase in supply. Say for the majority of the United States, more stability than anything else, but. It is it comes very salesy to say you should do it now. You should do you should buy a house today when there's less competition because rates are lower and as rates come down, more demand is going to pick up. There's some truth to that though, and it's it's one of those things that hey, I'm just trying to tell you what's likely to happen. It might come off salesy, but being doing this 20 years, and I know that waiting doesn't offer better opportunities in most cases. Well, Jeb, it's salesy if you leave out the if that you always finish that statement with, that I finish that statement with, that we talk about on the show. So you shouldn't wait, you should do it now if. So the if is, if now is the right time, you you have a stable job, you've got your credit in a good place, you've saved up money, you're getting married, you're having a baby, you need that space. If buying a home is right for you now, I wouldn't wait six months thinking it's going to get better. If buying a home is right for you in six months, I wouldn't do it today because I think today is better than six months from now, if that makes any sense. No, it does. I mean, and, but I think people have to apply it to their own lives. You've got to figure out your plan, right? Stick to your plan. Don't watch people online and determine whether or not it's right, right? Determine it based on your conversations with your partner and maybe you're a single or whatever, but whatever you feel is important. You know, Josh didn't mention the longer term time horizon is important. Having some money in the bank is important. Being comfortable with the payment. You don't have to like the payment. I didn't like the payment in November when I bought that new house. I, it's significantly higher than my previous payment. Didn't like it. Fortunately, I, it's come down $800 with, with two refinances that I've done over the last year. And I like it a little bit more. I'm starting to like that payment, um, especially compared to where it was, right? When it's higher and now it's lower, I like that. Um, so you got to you gotta be comfortable with it, even though you might not like it. And I don't know if you caught that, guys, but I said something important. I refinanced two times over the last year, thinking that rates were going to come down. If you watch our videos, I often talk about, I think rates are going to continue to move lower. Not tomorrow, not next week, but over time, they're going to move lower. So why didn't I wait? And just refinance one time because every time I refinanced, it was saving me about 400 bucks based on my loan amount if I could cut it about half a percent. So I went from seven to six and a half now to six, saved $800 over that period of time, which is a huge improvement, right? That That's money in my pocket. That's real money, guys. And I was able to do it no cost out of pocket because I worked with a professional, somebody that could guide me through the process. And you know that's ultimately what you have to be doing out there, right? Not worrying about what you think is going to happen. Take advantage of today because tomorrow, you know, you don't know, you don't know what's going to be there. Right. So but let's look at the beauty of mortgages in the United States, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA, which is more than 90% of the market. They have no prepayment penalty. Those are done 97% of the time with fixed rates. So what is a fixed rate? It gives you the right to own a home never worry about your principal and interest payment going up with an option to lower it anytime it gets better. So Jeb exercised that option twice in the first year of home ownership. He has a large loan, he's in a low closing cost state, so it was fairly easy to take a very marginally higher interest rate and cover all of that. So the cost of your option 
is going to be dictated by where you're at. You know, some states, Florida, New Jersey, they've got these little taxes that they add in there. Um, some states have much higher costs for title insurance, makes the costs higher. You know, for most of our clients here in California, that average loan amount is over $500,000. Average closing costs are $2,500 or less. That's like a half of a point. So generally for an eighth of a percent in interest, you can do it at no cost. So no cost exercising that option to roll down to the lower interest rate. So that's the, the rationale for saying, if rates are significantly better and we can put you into a new loan today and your recoup is less than six months on that, I say move today and do it today. Um, we do believe rates are going to go lower and you're probably going to redo it like Jeb has done once in the, in the next 12 months. Now, I'll tell you some commonalities of the folks that I talked to that were deciding to hold off. Um, lower credit scores, so they're not seeing as much of the benefit of, of lower interest rates. Higher loan to value. Um, many of them have FHA loans, so the closing costs on an FHA, uh, we can't cover all of those for the most part in, in a, a no closing cost loan because there's an upfront mortgage insurance premium. Mm -hmm. So with that, those people are rightfully saying, yeah, there's some savings there. And for those, what I can say is they're all loans in the two hundred fifty dollars to $350,000 range. So when they look at that, so I'm paying a decent amount of costs. The savings is not huge. So my break even on that is 18, 24 months out. So that is what you need to be looking at. There's what, what I would say is if you have a loan with a rate six and a half percent or higher, you should reach out to a mortgage professional today and have those numbers run. If they're telling you, hey, you have to do it. This is the greatest thing ever, regardless of what those costs look like, then just run away. But what they should be doing for you is calculating. Here's what you have. Here's what you can get. Here's what the cost would be and what is a no cost option? What does that look like? Or what does a low cost option look like? And if you can do it at low to no cost, it, it is kind of a no brainer to exercise that option and then watch the market and see what happens over the next one to two years. Yeah. And if you want to have that, you want to exercise that option, use that uh, link in the description of the video. You can get in touch with Josh and our team. But what I'll say to end this video is that you have to control the controllables. You have to control what you know is, is, is there at the moment and not try to figure out what's going to be in the future, right? Too many people are trying to predict what's going to happen versus just taking advantage of what is in front of them. If you do that, you'll be in a much better position long run. And maybe now is not the right time, but you, you got to do what you can do. Otherwise, um, you could be setting yourself up for, you know, a potential miss in an opportunity um, by, by pushing it off in the future. But either way, guys, we appreciate you watching. We appreciate the support. We will see you again next week. Adios. Amigos.